Dear friends, this is Bishop Daniel Thomas of the Diocese of Toledo. Please join me now in praying together our diocesan prayer. Heavenly Father, with the redeeming cross of Christ Jesus, your Son, and the gifts of your Holy Spirit, renew and strengthen us, so that by our prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we may foster holy disciples, holy families, and holy vocations, so as to become a more holy diocese of Toledo. We turn to Our Lady, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, for her intercession and never-failing prayers. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Annunciation Radio presents Faith Alive. Highlighting the many ways Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo provides love and support for those in need. And now, your host for Faith Alive, Executive Director of Catholic Charities in Toledo, Rodney Schuster. Hello and welcome to Faith Alive, the program that shares how the love of Jesus Christ is provided through the ministries of Catholic Charities throughout the Diocese of Toledo. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities. And today we're going to really focus on ministries that serve food a couple places in our diocese. You know, Catholic Charities does that through our ministries at Helping Hands and Hope Food Pantry and, of course, our shelters at La Posada and Miriam House. But there are some great ministries within the diocese through parish efforts that do some great work. And I think, you know, as part of the Catholic Church, we do so much in the way of education, in the way of health care, but really in the way of helping with social services throughout the world. And we've been at the forefront of that to provide the most basic needs to people and help, food, clothing, and shelter. And so while we have this program, we talk about a lot of the ministries at Catholic Charities, we also realize that there are many, many parish-based ministries that do great work in providing those basic needs of food and sometimes of clothing and sometimes help with getting people directed to get some uh, shelter. So we're very blessed to have with us today uh, Deacon Phil DeNovo and Tom Lucas. Uh, Deacon Phil is uh, at um, uh, the parishes in Sandusky. And then we've got Tom Lucas, who's a program coordinator for Catholic Charities, uh, heading up the food ministry. I mean, the furniture ministry, excuse me. And, you know, Tom works at Holy Angels, which provides uh, food and community meals. So welcome, gentlemen. Well, great to be here. Wonderful. You, Thank you, Rodney. So, Deacon Phil, can you provide just a background and overview of the meals that are offered at Catholic at, at Holy Angels Catholic Church and how that started and, and how many people you're serving and who does all the effort, et cetera? Certainly. Well, the, the, uh, the beginning of the Catholic Community Supper is what we call it mm-hmm. in Sandusky actually started, uh, I'm guessing probably about 40 years ago. Wow. And it was uh, actually started by members of St. Mary's. Uh, it was actually a St. Mary's ministry that was being held at Holy Angels because they had the facilities uh, to do it. So uh, our our friends at Holy Angels at the time uh, allowed St. Mary to come in and run this community supper uh, program. But ever since uh, 2012, the um, when the three parishes were put under one pastoral team, it's actually now a tri-parish ministry, okay. still housed at Holy Angels, and it's changed over the years, and particularly uh, through COVID and everything. Um, probably at its height, uh, we were probably serving maybe 200 meals every Wednesday, except the first Wednesday of the month, mm-hmm. uh, prior to COVID, um, we were doing that. And um, just like everything else, COVID uh, certainly had an effect. And I am proud to say that uh, while we could not have in-person meals, and that was the big thing, you know, we call it community supper. Yeah. So it was a time for people to come, and if they were in need of a good, nutritious meal. And But uh, the community aspect was very important, that people visit with other people and come together um, to enjoy that meal, um, is, which is very important, of course, that, that social aspect sure. of, uh, of a dinner. Um so at its height, probably you know, about anywhere between 150 to 200, uh, maybe sometimes even more meals were served. And also, um, people had the opportunity then to, uh, to come in and get some take home, 
um, boxes to go take to their uh, family or friends who couldn't be there. So now with uh, COVID, uh, again, I'm proud to say that we did not stop during COVID, wow. at least serving meals. We couldn't serve in person, of course, mm-hmm. but... Um, uh, in what we thought was just going to be a couple weeks at the time, uh, turned out to be over a year and a half of serving, uh, basically preparing meals and then having people come to the back door of the, uh, parish hall at, uh, Holy Angels to have to go containers. So at least they would have something to take home and, uh, eat. Now, as we were coming out of COVID, we tried a couple different times to offer in-person meals again, but the, uh, our, uh, our community that would come to eat wasn't ready for that necessarily. So, um, we continued the to go or, uh, to go meals for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And then we gradually introduced again the, uh, the in-person dining experience tried to uh, get encourage people to come together in community as they were um, comfortable with. Um, right now, I would say uh, eating in person um, is about thirty people right now. Mm-hmm. But we permit we still prepare about one hundred and fifty meals a week. Wow! Uh, so uh, most people are still taking to go, and even those people that come to eat in person will take. You know, three or four at home to, uh, either, uh, for other family members or neighbors who couldn't make the trip then. Or, and I'm okay with this too, is that, you know, maybe it's, they need uh, meals for themselves for the next couple of days to get through. Sure. So, uh, we have that, uh, they have that option. We also, uh, of the 150 meals that we prepare, about 45 to 50 are actually prepared for a high rise apartment building in Sandusky where the uh, there are volunteers from that community that come over to pick up the uh, the dinners and take them back and distribute them to those who requested them and a lot of them just, uh, eat in community together in the uh, in that apartment building um, so uh, it's a great ministry that we have uh, uh, there we went on for quite a while but it's gone through a couple changes here in just the last couple of years that we're still trying to get out of you're listening to Faith Alive, and our guests are uh, Deacon Phil DeNovo and uh, Tom Lucas, uh, both representing uh, the Sandusky Parishes, uh, and talking about the community uh, supper, you call Catholic it? Catholic Community Supper. Catholic Community Supper uh, and the changes. So, Tom, you know, Catholic Charities, uh, uh, what's their role in it? I know, I believe you volunteer there uh, to help with the meals or in some form or fashion, but does Catholic Charities actually have a, a role as part of that? Well, you know, uh, to be, to be, uh, clear, um, to this point, Catholic Charities, in the past, Catholic Charities was involved pre-COVID. And of course, that was before my uh, association with Catholic Charities. But, um, once COVID hit, uh, as, as Deacon Phil said, things kind of shut down and closed down. Um, to this point, Catholic Charities is still transitioning back into, um, taking part with the, the community supper meals. Um, and so we're actually looking forward, um, we're, we're looking to get more involved just to have a presence there, you know, interact with some of the people that are there. As, as Deacon Phil said, there's not a, a large number that are, are coming on a regular basis, but we hope that that will increase in, in the future. But Catholic Charities, just we want to have a presence there to intermingle with them and just kind of sit down and chat with the people and, you know, say, you know, as, as Phil said, it's a community supper as in the community of, of people interacting yeah. face-to-face with people. So we wanted to, to uh, bring that aspect back to that and, and see what, what uh, ways Catholic Charities might be able to help or expand our services in the future. Well, and I think that's great because I think that part of our service is, you know, first of all, provide basic needs, which is in this case food. food. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then as part of that dignity and respect is to say, you know, can I have a meal with you? What's your name? Where are you from? I, have you been in Sandusky all your life? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what are things going on in your life? Uh, what, what dreams do you have or did you have? And is there anything that's, you know, kind of a barrier in your life? And perhaps we can help, you know, and, and we can't provide all the services that people might need. But based on our efforts uh, in the Sandusky area, we could say, wow, well, you know what? You could probably check out this place and mm-hmm. this place and this place. And help with some of those systemic issues. And then, uh, well, hopefully I'll see you next month uh, or next week 
and uh, maybe we can have a meal again and see how that's working sure. for you. So, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in the Catholic Charities office with with our crisis navigation ministry, you know, the number of people who call in who have problems or issues, and a lot of times they call in with one problem, but but you know, understandably, there's a lot of different things going on. But uh, when when our crisis navigator will talk to somebody on the phone and and work through some of their issues, and again, just that friendly voice that they hear, you know, the 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 uplifting spirit that that can give to people, I think, you know, taken on the community supper level is is another opportunity to do that same thing where, you know, if it's just having a conversation with somebody, that knowing that somebody cares, nobody that somebody's interested in their life and, and what's going on in their life, um, that does wonders for people who might be having a bad day or, or a bad week or month. Right. Um, right. And I get an opportunity to pray with people. They come up and, you know, they'll say, you know, please pray for my daughter, please pray for my granddaughter or my father or brother or you know, particularly if there's a death recently in their family, I get an opportunity to pray with them on the spot right there mm. uh, to let them know that, you know, we have a community here that cares about you and wants to uh, help you and just to be that listening ear at times, uh, too. So it has that aspect. You know, listening to Faith Alive, and our guests are Deacon Phil DeNovo and Tom Lucas. So Deacon Phil, uh, you know, as the the... You know, the churches get involved, the parishes get involved uh, in this ministry. What are some of the things that you could use help with? I mean, is it, do you have plenty of volunteers? Do you have people, <laughs> enough people to make food, or could you use some help? Oh, we could definitely use help. We, uh, we uh, could, we have some great people that are consistently there either, either every week or maybe a particular Wednesday each month mm-hmm. that they're there. Uh, we definitely, we lost, you know, during COVID, there were quite yeah. a few a lot of volunteers who, of course, they got older. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple actually passed away mm-hmm. that have been regular volunteers or aren't physically able to um, continue or resume the ministry they love participating in. So, yes, we can definitely use volunteers. And if anybody's interested, they can call me at 419-625-7500. That's the number for the um, Catholic Parishes of Sandusky. Just ask for Deacon Phil, and they'll put you in t- contact with me. And thankfully, I'm not a person that belongs in the kitchen. So I'm sort of, <laughs> so I, I, I come up in time to be sort of the front man, and I talk to visit with people there. But we have a great uh, team of volunteers led by our one of our staff members, Shannon McCabe, who organizes, gets the food every week, and... Uh, coordinates the volunteers that come in um, and just, uh, you know, make sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, but we definitely could use volunteers to help with that. And I have to give a shout out to my uh, fellow Knights of Columbus member, Mario Barone, mm-hmm. who has been with me ever since COVID started. He volunteered coming every Wednesday through that. And sometimes it was just him and me at the beginning, and then we gradually bring other people when he found out that I should not be in the kitchen. So, uh, you know, so he has been there every single week. Maybe in the last three years, I can probably count on one hand how many Wednesdays he was not able to be there. Wow. And he has just been, um, we, he, he knows what he's doing. He's comfortable in the kitchen and just a great, joyful man that, uh, and we have a lot of actually members of Knights of Columbus that help us out too. That's great. And so, do you prepare the meals there and then serve them every week? Yes. So, meals. so do you need food donations, or do you, do you need cooks, or how? What would be the best I mean, thing for people? The to best help? thing is that you know we need bodies to be there to help uh, prepare, oh. to serve, to clean up. Uh, those are the things. But if somebody is, uh, you know, wants to make a donation to um, the Catholic Community Supper, they certainly can do that by. Um, uh, sending it to St. Mary's because St. Mary's is the one that still does the finances for it. Or um, uh, as far as food, I think you know, uh, probably the, a monetary donation would benefit. Okay. Uh, so we give you the Shannon, flexibility of yeah. filling in the holes. Shannon in the is very good about stretching the dollar and knowing you know what we need, and she can get uh, in bulk what she needs and everything for those. But, for those who are listening, then if they want to write a check, uh, who they should make it out to St. Mary's Catholic Church or St. Mary's Parish in Sandusky. Okay. Um, uh, and write community, uh, CCS or Catholic Community to Supper on the memo line. Uh, maybe send it to my attention. Okay. Um, uh, drop it in the, uh, collection basket, uh, to me or mail it, uh, to my attention and they'll make sure I get it and then I can, uh, make sure it gets deposited in the right account. Great, so, great. And then once again, Deacon Phil, if somebody wants to help, uh, either in setup, in cooking, in serving or cleanup, 
uh, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, call me at 419-625-7500, extension 1015, or just ask for uh, Deacon Phil, or they can also ask for Shannon McCabe, too. All right, and then is there an email address, too, or does it just go to the parish email, or what would be the best uh, I way? Would, uh, to, um, they can send an email to me, p-d-i-n-o-v-o at SanduskyCatholic.org, um, that way, too. But um, Awesome. Yeah, call. Well, it's a beautiful ministry and just, you know, helps, again, people with the basic needs, but also beyond that, the spiritual needs and praying with them and learning more about their situation and what's going on in their lives. And, uh, you know, so we're thankful for uh, both Tom and, and your work that you're doing and Tricia uh, at uh, Catholic Charities in Sandusky and then, of course, Deacon Phil and uh, the Knights and everybody who volunteers at the Catholic Community Supper every Wednesday except the first Wednesday, right? Correct. Every Wednesday, so at Holy Angels. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the great work that you do for people in need. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you. We're going to head to break. We'll be right back. Now, another personal account of the good work being done by Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. This is an interview done by La Posada Program Coordinator Janelle Addy at the recent back-to-school stop-in. Here is a new resident who sought the services of the La Posada Family Emergency Shelter when he recently lost his job. Well, hello. Hi. How are you today? Can't complain. Having that's, fun. That's great. Okay, I know this might be different for you because how long have you been here now? Um, 24 hours now. That's what I thought. You're brand new to our facility. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how are you feeling about it so far? Um, I won't lie. The first day I was nervous and um, the kids were as well. Uh, they didn't sleep well at first, but at about 5 o'clock they end up dozing off and being asleep the rest of the time so okay so is this your first well no you kind of shared a little bit with me you You know you didn't share with me why you're here that's not even an event you're here for services so we do know that um no out of your mouth you did say that you know like you were skeptical about this so how are you feeling now uh it's amazing it really is um everyone is extremely nice uh they go out of their way more than most places like most people would in general nowadays especially um and it it's just amazing that's wonderful i'm glad you feel that way our whole goal is to make people feel comfortable while they're here do you feel like it's a home environment oh yes and then all the other families are very welcoming and they're so nice um like the one lady uh she actually she had a double stroller she trading for a single one so that way my wife because she's pregnant can have the double and everything oh wow yeah, that's great. So, like, it really, everyone is, they just go out of their way, even the families here. Amazing. So, what do you hope to gain while you're here? What is your, I know we, you haven't, like I said, you've only been here 24 hours, and I will be your case manager. Yes, ma'am. So, I'm trying, I guess this is helping me gain a little bit of insight um, of you. Of course, your number one goal is to obtain housing, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then. And saying that, what else would you like to do while you're here? Um, it. I've always been told perspective when it comes to things. Um, I was nervous at first, but then I, my mother, um, she, we were actually in a, sh- a shelter with her when I was nine years old, roughly. It was a battered woman shelter. Okay. Um, so it wasn't like exactly new coming here, but I won't lie, I can't remember it. Like okay. I, I remember playing around with kids and like the community room kind of thing, but other than that, I, I don't remember any of it. So like this is this is kind of new. Yes, yeah. and. Everyone, like I keep saying, everyone is really open, like nice, and like I just, it's nice because now my kids actually have more people close. It, as crazy as it sounds, even though I'm just meeting these people, but they're all nice. My kids actually can have friends just literally right out the door, just excited. Like Toby, he there's a little girl around here, and Toby's literally he a bracelet for her and everything. <laughs> oh, that's so, like, cute. Yeah, I know your daughter calls one up, calls calls the other case manager her friend. She's like, "Hi, friend! <laughs> Hi, friend!" <laughs> so she's she's already got her friend and mm-hmm. a big friend, huh? <laughs> yeah, but she as soon as she sees her, she she just lights up. That's wonderful. Well, our whole goal, like I said, is to give a hand up, not a handout. I don't think you're looking for a handout because you guys just seem that you're just down in your luck and you just need a little help. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, ma'am. I I'm actually just out of. I'm not used to looking for jobs. Um, the job I had before, um, before I came up this way, I was working for factories, and then I got a job up here for so- helping someone run a whole like pizza shop. 
Mm-hmm. So more or less, I ran one shop for him. He ran the other, and things slowed down. So literally, the last six years, I've never, ha- I haven't had to look for a job. I went from a job to a job. So the, the whole so process like, is new for you. Every like looking for a job, I I can't even find the places online to find them. There, there, it's not easy on their websites to find them. Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to assist you, and that's what I'll be doing for you, since you did inform me that you have an interest in that. So where, um, so how long have you been in this area? Um, I've lived in Toledo and Northwood area my whole life, roughly. Okay. Did you leave and come back, or? Um, I did. I ended up leaving 2018 when uh, Ember was born. We went uh, to North Baltimore area. Okay. Um, I lived in some uh, apartments up there for a while, and then we came back up this way just because we spent a lot of time down there. That's where her family was. Okay. And I, we kind of grew away from mine, and we came up this way, and... Then here we are now. Okay, then. Well, as I said, um, we hope that while you're here, you get the things that you know, need. Um, and we will be supporting you and making sure that uh, you use this as your platform to move higher. Okay? Yes, ma'am. And thank you for talking to me. No problem. I appreciate it. I, like, I, like I said, everything you guys are doing is amazing. Okay, but well, thanks for talking to me. Have you ever wondered how to better understand the scriptures? What does the Bible say to us in our day-to-day life? This is Peter Sibelio, the Bible teacher at Lord's University, and I'm happy to answer your Bible questions here on Annunciation Radio. Listen for Bible Basics, a daily feature to help you understand scripture and how to apply it to daily life. Email your questions to me at feedback at annunciationradio.com and listen for my answers to your inquiries. Hi, I'm Father Dave Nuss, excited to share with you the new Friday Commute lineup on Annunciation Radio. First, at 4 p.m., my show, Understanding Scripture. At 4.30 p.m., my podcast, Casting the Net, co-hosted with Brother in Christ, Rick Lingvi. We're hoping you tune in. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. Welcome back to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. And a great gift today to share some of the the parish efforts that are involved in helping provide food. Uh, we heard from uh, Deacon Phil and Tom Lucas and some of the work they're doing at Holy Angels with their Catholic Community Supper uh, every Wednesday. And now we're blessed to have uh, Chris Kramer from St. Pat Heatherdown's Parish. And she's going to talk a little bit about their food pantry, what they do, how they do it. Chris, welcome to Faith Alive. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So share a little bit about what uh, St. Pat Heatherdowns does to provide food for folks in need. Well, as part of St. Vincent de Paul, we have a pantry on our grounds at St. Pat's, and we take appointments, and our neighbors, we call them neighbors, Mm -hmm. can come once a month to get food. So it's been a blessing to be able to do that. And how many people are you serving on a, is this a weekly basis, a daily basis? How often do you okay. do it? We basically do it once a week. Mm-hmm. We're serving around 15 families. Okay. And out of that 15 families, usually five are home deliveries. Wow. Cause we are serving people without transportation mm-hmm. in our area. And how do they find out about the work that you do? And if they, you know, if they want to get, you know, if they say, gosh, I could, I need food. How do they find out about it? And how do you then take that information and try to get them signed up? Yes, they call our helpline number, which is 419-381-9835. And they call us and a volunteer calls them back and we talk with them. We confirm their address because there's a number of pantries in our area and we're serving 43614. We're serving part of St. Charles and OLPH also, because there are no pantries there. Mm-hmm. So they call and set up an appointment with our volunteers, and then we set, we, they come and drive to our pantry, and we give them what they need food-wise. And how uh, long have you been involved with the pantry? I've been involved about 10 years. Oh, now. my goodness. And we moved out of the basement of the old rectory to the upper window room <laughs> pantry, which now we have light um, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been great. And when people come to you, what, what are some of the things that stand out to you as far as, as they maybe share a little bit more about their situation and, and as they come 
to get food. What what is it? What have you seen? Well, the trend I'm seeing at the moment are the senior citizens mm. over the age of sixty. A lot of single women, widowed, who are not having wonderful benefits. Mm. A lot of single moms with children. Um, that's the trend at the moment. And how do they respond when either they first call you and say, "Oh, you can help," and then, or you can deliver? Uh, what's the response of the people you help? Very, very positive. Um, sometimes there's tears mm. because, as we're discovering in the last few months, some people said, "I never thought I would call a pantry for help." Wow! Wow! Economics. Yeah, you listen to Faith Alive, and our guest is uh, Chris Kramer from St. Pat Heatherdown's Parish, and she's talking about the food pantry that they offer uh, to folks uh, in need, both uh, who come come to get food and then deliver food. So, Chris, what are some of the things that um, you need in the way? Do you need volunteers? Do you need food? And um, uh, how could people, you know, do that if they want to get involved? And you don't just have to be from St. Pat Heatherdown's. You can oh, be no. from anywhere. But how could people, you know, provide some help? And- Thank you. Well, we have a um, a monthly food collection that happens the second Saturday of every month. We just had ours on Saturday. Okay. Where we ask for non-perishable food and hygiene products. Um, our big need right now is hygiene products because your food stamps do not allow you to purchase hygiene right, products. Right. Uh, we had a very great feed our neighbor food drive on a Saturday. So it was awesome. Um, so they can contact us at the phone number, the 419-381-9835, or they can email me at svdp at toledostpats.org with their information or their questions. And donations, monetary donations are always welcomed. And they can be mailed to St. Patrick's of Heather Downs in Toledo. And probably put in the subject line, food pantry. Food or... pantry, St. Vincent de Paul. Yeah. And what about volunteers? Is there, do you need any volunteers? I could use a few more, but okay. right now we have about 30. Oh, wow. And our pantry is as big as this recording studio. Okay. So it's a little tight in there. <laughs> it's a, So it's a, just for folks who are listening, try to get a, a grasp on that. Probably... 20 by 20? Yes. So 400 square feet where you're trying to get all that food in there and you can't have too much. Otherwise, you have no place to store it, right? Right. And we have two refrigerators and two freezers. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, there's only so much room for volunteers. But we are serving, you know, sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week. The middle of the month is the busiest time. And then were you able to serve during COVID or did you have to cease at that point? No, we continued. Wow. Because... All we had to do is put it in the trunk of their cars. Okay. So they would literally pull up to the door. Mm -hmm. We would confirm who they were. We were all outside, Mm -hmm. kept our distance, and then we put their food items and hygiene items in the trunks of their cars. Wow. You're listening to to Chris Kramer from St. Pat Heather Downs Parish, and she's talking about the food pantry. So, Chris... uh, how did you first get interested in doing this? I mean, did, did the Holy Spirit tap you on the shoulder, or did a, a priest or somebody else tap you on the shoulder? Well, I grew up at Clyde St. Mary's, and my family was a very outreachy family. <laughs> and I graduated from Fremont St. Joe's. So it's been in my blood. Okay. And I, various moving around with my husband, we ended up at St. Pat's, his home parish. And I was very impressed with how it, St. Vincent de Paul and the pantry functioned there. Mm-hmm. So I got involved. Wow, wow. And, you know, with your involvement, what's it like personally for you? I mean, it sounds like it's pretty rewarding for you. And, um, you know, what are some of the, the memories that you have over the years, the 10 years that you've served there that have really stood out to you as something like, you know, thank you, Lord, for that confirmation that I'm doing this and I continue doing this. Uh, uh, anything that you can share? Well, recently I was talking to one of our home delivery ladies and she didn't pick up the phone. So I got to listen to her voice message, which was a scripture quote and a prayer. So when I called her back, we were talking about her home delivery and she started praying for me, affirming me that I am. She was so grateful. She wanted to pray for me. And I thought, wow, you know, could you have some days that are really tough? Yeah. And 
that was so affirming. Or the single moms that are in between jobs and are raising five kids. Mm. And usually there's a med- a medical issue with one of the kids. And those are very sad and, and also rewarding. Mm. Any stories that stick out to you specifically over the years that, you know, that you and, and the food pantry help somebody and it just, you know, they, they share with you how much you talked about tears, but any specific stories that you can share? Well, we have a grandmother slash great grandmother who's raising six boys. Oh my goodness. And she's had issues, you know, financially and food wise. And, um, She's had to move out of our area because she needed a bigger place because the one young grandson cannot do stairs anymore. Mm -hmm. So she's been a case that, case, a person I've known for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I give this grandmother prayers and courage to raise six boys in today's world. Yeah, yeah. And she must probably be so thankful she is. that St. Pat Heather Downs does this, this great ministry of providing food and, and helping her even though she moved and just as she's changed, uh, over time. So that's great. Listening to Chris Kramer, who's, uh, from St. Pat Heather Downs, uh, parish food pantry. And Chris, again, how, if, if somebody who needs food, uh, wants to get in touch and then somebody who wants to help either volunteer, provide financial support, provide food donations, uh, how can they get in, in touch? Okay. So if they just call our helpline at 419-381-9835 and leave a message, okay. one of our volunteers will call them back. And if they want to volunteer their time, um, my one of my volunteers will say, Chris, please call so-and-so. So Or they can reach us with email through St. SV dp at toledo st pats.org right and as always you know and i know being at, at catholic charities uh financial support is always a great benefit because when you have a, a financial gift that gives you the freedom to buy things that maybe you don't have in stock uh and so you don't have too much of an item and and you can kind of fill in the gaps uh to make sure everybody gets a, a nice you know balanced um uh food either delivered or when they come pick it up and so, uh, you know, again, and you can just make those checks out to St. Pat Heather Downs Parish and put in the subject line food pantry and they'll make sure that, uh, they get those resources. So, you know, we've gone through COVID. We got post COVID. Have you seen the needs increasing lately, decreasing? What have you seen, Chris? I see the needs increasing. Okay. I see people who before could stretch their dollars. And, um, it's really becoming a lot more difficult to make ends meet. When you take in consideration where we're located, there's a lot of rental properties. Rent has gone up. Everybody in our area is Toledo Edison. Those bills have gone up too. So between the rent and Edison and the food cost, it's harder and harder for people to make ends meet. Once again, the phone number? 419-381-9835. And if they want to email you? SVDP at ToledoStPats.org. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for your 10 years of service at the food pantry at St. Pat Heather Downs. And, you know, again, just we wanted to share uh, both at St. Pat Heather Downs and uh, uh, Holy Angels. We were going to talk about St. Uh, Joan of Arc, but um, uh, unfortunately our guests had to, to cancel. But, uh, Chris, thank you for the ministry that you do at St. Pat Heather Downs. Thank you. And- We're going to head to break, but stay tuned for Dr. Ben Brown's This Week's Charity in Christ. We'll be right back. Catholic social teaching is in many ways simply the logical extension of Catholic anthropology or a Catholic understanding of what it means to be human. One very important aspect of being human is freedom, and much of Catholic social thought about things like law, economic policy, and human rights rests upon a particular understanding of freedom. I will delve into some of those in future segments, but in the next few weeks, we should first focus specifically on several aspects of freedom that are much misunderstood. The purpose of freedom, its relation to truth, choices, and rules, how it comes in degrees, and how freedom, in the end, is fully actualized only in love. Much of modernity has been built upon a notion of freedom as the ability to do whatever we want. 
which so greatly permeates our culture that we have a very difficult time thinking differently, even when we want to. It's everywhere in our literature, pop culture, entertainment, and politics. In this view, rules and authority stand opposed to freedom, as restrictions that get in its way and keep us from being whatever we want, which we equate with fulfillment. We've been raised on slogans like, follow your heart, happily ever after, don't let anything stand in your way, obey your thirst, and you can be whatever you want. Movie after movie shows authority figures being in the wrong, and heroes as those who flaunt the rules. One massive problem with this view, and there are others as well, is that it is fundamentally individualistic, pitting each person's freedom against everyone else's, because what someone else wants will inevitably get in my way, and what is good for the community is embodied as policies or laws that are inevitably restrictions on me, and thus at best compromises in which no one can get everything they want. If freedom is actually the ability to do what you want or choose, then no one will ever be completely free. Even our very bodies get in our way, so it seems, keeping us from living out our true gender or even our true species. This view can be traced back to many forms of existentialism and before that to nominalism, but we need not pursue those philosophies now, for this understanding of freedom goes back even further to the sin of our first parents and the fallen angels. Satan said, non servium, I will not serve. That is, no one can tell me what to do. I'm going to get what I want. Rebellion, disobedience, selfishness, pride. Those are some of the biblical names for this idea of freedom that so many of us have at least partially absorbed. And that should give us pause to reconsider. To develop a more correct and positive view of freedom, we need to start by realizing that freedom has a higher purpose, that it is not its own end. We don't choose something for the sheer exercise of willpower in choosing it, contrary to what Nietzsche thought, but so that we can get the actual thing, which is a good of some sort. We are free for a purpose that has been given to us and that we cannot choose differently. We're free so that we can personally, self-consciously attain the good, which is our fulfillment, flourishing, and happiness, which is ultimately God. But even if someone doesn't believe in God, they can still see that freedom has a higher purpose above it, namely, what is truly good for us. I'm free so that I can get, say, ice cream, but in a way that is human, not animalistic. Not too much, not at the wrong time, not with bad intentions, and always in a way that promotes my actual well-being and the well-being of others. I'm really just putting into words what is called virtue ethics which is both reason-based and fundamentally biblical and Catholic as well. In other words, humans are made to flourish, to be excellent, and freedom is our capacity to reach that excellence in a self-directed way through our wills. This conception of freedom has been named, quote-unquote, freedom for excellence. It is for something, something else, something higher, not merely for its own sake, as if it were merely the highest reality. Therefore, what we choose really matters. We can choose good things in a good way and thus reach genuine happiness, or we can choose things that undermine our happiness. In contrast, the typical modern view has been called quote-unquote freedom of indifference, because it holds that it is indifferent, that it doesn't matter what you choose as long as no one is forcing you. Now, of course, we all recognize on some level, that what we choose matters. The person who elects to try heroin is chosen badly and will soon find himself addicted, miserable, and having lost a great deal of his freedom on top of it. Yet, we still tend to think that rules are restrictive and we want to push against them. A better philosophy and ultimately theology of freedom is needed if our ethical, social, and political thought is ever going to be coherent. That is this week's Charity in Christ. I'm Dr. Ben Brown, Professor of Theology at Lourdes University. This is the day. This is the theme for this year's annual Catholic Appeal. Hello, everyone. Bishop Daniel Thomas here. Day by day, all of us are blessed by our Lord, and we know that as Catholics, we're charged with sharing our blessings with others. Your participation in our annual Catholic Appeal brings immediate help 
to individuals and families in crisis with food, counseling, care, and compassion. Your gift assists in Catholic education of our young people, promotes our priestly vocations, provides liturgical resources throughout our diocese, and so much more. This is the day. I invite you this day to please give generously to our annual Catholic Appeal at your parish or online at acatoledo.org. So grateful for your generosity to our annual Catholic Appeal. We depend on your goodness. God bless you. Every day, abortion affects the lives of thousands of women. But for every woman affected, there is a man who has also lost a child. Too often, we as men don't think we can feel hurt or sadness over this loss. But there is help, and there is hope. If you or someone you know has experience with abortion, please reach out to the Joseph Ministry at 419-299-6660 or visit catholiccharitiesnwo.org for more information. God wants you to return to him and to experience the love and mercy that is waiting you as his beloved son. I'm Peter Range, Executive Director of Ohio Right to Life. Please join me every week for Say Yes to Life right here on Annunciation Radio. Get the latest pro-life news, events, and hear from many in the pro-life movement as we work to protect and defend every human life, including the pre-born, from conception to natural death. Say Yes to Life can be heard right here on Annunciation Radio every Thursday live at 4 p.m. Catch us at AnnunciationRadio.com. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. Welcome back to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. And you heard in our first two segments about how we're doing locally in the diocese, helping people with food at uh, uh, St. Pat Heather Downs, as well as providing furniture for folks at Holy out of uh, Holy Angels Catholic Church in Sandusky. Well, now we're very fortunate to have on Dr. Kelly Johnson. She's the Associate Professor of uh, Father Harry, Chair of Social Justice at the University of Dayton, and she's going to talk a little bit about how to say grace over meals. Dr. Johnson, welcome to Faith Alive. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. So share a little bit about that. You mentioned about uh, how to say grace. So unpack that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got to thinking about this question because um, my family know that I've studied theology. And so for big family gatherings, they would sometimes lean on me to be the one who would say <laughs> grace before the meal. And um, as you know, Catholics, we like our bless us, O Lord. And I, I am totally in favor of bless us, O Lord. I'm fine with that. <laughs> But of course, at big occasions, um, people want something um, more than that. And I think a lot of us find that difficult, a little awkward. We're not used to praying out loud. Catholics usually don't um, do a lot of extemporaneous prayer, but um, they wanted me to do it. And so I tried to do it and I started realizing just how, just how hard it is to say a good prayer over meal. When you know that you live in um, in an unjust food economy, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's how I got started thinking about this. It was also a few years ago. Well, gosh, it's been almost ten years ago now. When Pope Francis published La Si um, mm-hmm. on our common home, the the encyclical letter about um, the environment. There's a bit in there where he, among many recommendations, huge, big, sort of vast. Um, political recommendations. He also calls on people to um, renew the practice of saying prayers before and after meals. Um, And what he says is uh, that moment of blessing, however brief, reminds us of our dependence on God for life. It strengthens our feeling of gratitude for the gifts of creation. It acknowledges those who by their labors provide us with those good, it reaffirms our solidarity with those in greatest need. So, uh, so I was thinking, okay, well, this is actually kind of a big deal. We ought to be praying before and after meals, but it seemed hard to me. So mm-hmm. I've, I've put a little time into trying to think about that. You listen to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, and our guest is Dr. Kelly Johnson, who's the Associate Professor of the Father Fareed. Am I pronouncing that right? <laughs> I, I hold the Father Fareed Chair of Social Justice. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So talk about, um, you know, so how then has it, you know, fast forward, how has that impacted you now when somebody asks you to, mm. uh, you know, say grace uh, over yeah. meals? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so I think, you know, I, the first things I had to do was kind of figure out what's going on with that part that we feel uncomfortable with. I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable when you're saying grace over a meal. And you know you live in a society where there is quite a lot of hunger. I think the numbers are in Ohio, it's more than one in 10 yeah. people yes. are considered food insecure, right? Um, right. At something like 15% of the children here. And that's before we start talking globally. So um, oftentimes, you know, I, I use the same solution that a lot of people will, which is kind of in the middle of the prayer where you're giving thanks to say, um, something about remembering those who go without, maybe asking God to meet their needs or um, asking that we be made more mindful of their needs. And it, it always left me a, a little um, uneasy. It's a little unsatisfying. So for me, the as I dug into it, what I began to realize is that um, the, I think that the problem hidden inside this is that we talk about food as a gift. When we're saying grace, we're giving thanks for the gift of food. Mm -hmm. But we live in in a world, and most of the time, the way we deal with food, it's not a gift. It's something we buy, something we buy and sell. And so there's this kind of, it's not just that I need to remember that people are poor. There's this sort of struggle inside there over whether food really is a gift given by God or whether it's Something that if you have enough money, you get it, and if you don't have enough money, you don't get it. Yeah. So, well, I, I, um, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Well, and I think too, it's you know, that if we thank God for provision, realizing that you know, for the, with the grace, just by the you know grace of God, we're in positions where we're able to receive food and and be successful, um, but some are not, and you know, well, if you just go ahead. So, I, yeah, I would push back on that a little bit. So in right. Catholic social tradition, there is this basic principle, and if people are interested, they can look up in the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. There's a big section mm-hmm. on this that's um, called the universal destination of goods. Mm-hmm. And that's like your that's your $10 phrase. What it means is God didn't make some people rich and some people poor. Right. God made the earth to meet everybody's needs. The, the intention is for the earth for us to share the goods of the earth in such a way that everybody is able to use them to meet their needs. And if we've organized the earth so that some people can't, that's our doing. It's not God's doing. So I'm very, the the thing that has changed in the way I say grace is it's absolutely important for us to be thankful. Absolutely right for us to be grateful for food. It is a gift of God. But what we need to be grateful for is that God has given the earth and its food to feed all people. And that's, so the first step in the way I say grace now is to begin by giving thanks for the goodness of creation, which produces food for us, food that's meant to meet everybody's needs. That's what to be grateful for. I, um, uh, I think it's important to be clear that if we're, um, in a position of financial privilege, that may have something to do with, um, God's blessing. It may have something to do with our hard work. It may have something to do with luck. It may have something to do with historical injustices. So um, that's not that's not what the blessing is. The blessing is that God has given us an earth that's meant to be home for all of us together. That's what we're grateful for. You listen to Faith Alive, and our guest is uh, Dr. Kelly Johnson, who's the Associate Professor of the Father Furry Chair of Social Justice at the University of Dayton. And, you know, Dr. Johnson, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's why the, the ministries that are serving uh, throughout the world are so vital and without those folks who um, either volunteer or do, you know, food drives or clothing drives or provide financial support, there is no way we could help as many people as we do just here at Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo, but, you know, through uh, ministries throughout the world. And, and I'm thankful because without that support, without that engagement, Boy, we, there's no way we could help as many people as we do. And I think that's something that I think it leads up to what you're just sharing. It's like, okay, there's, there's a need. And so what can we do? What action can we take? What Christ-like action mm-hmm. can we take to help make a difference? Mm-hmm. Well, a really important thing I'd want to point out to your listeners, um, 
is uh, and boy, I know this doesn't this doesn't sound exciting and beautiful, but bear with me. Um, uh, the up the farm bill, mm-hmm. right, which is a a major piece of legislation, um, and the USCCB have written letters on this where they're discussing the importance of. Um, designing a farm bill so that it's centered on making sure that first everybody gets food and so that farm workers get adequate wages and safe working conditions. There's a bit at the beginning of their letter, which again, people could easily find online by looking up um, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, their statement on the 2023 farm bill. Um, at, right at the beginning of it, it says, in the words of Pope Francis, hunger is criminal and food is an inalienable right. So they're urging absolutely that people volunteer and be involved in um, all kinds of personal efforts. That's, that's of course, crucial. But also that we be attentive to the fact that um, our food system is shaped by policies and laws mm-hmm. that we in a democracy can influence. And uh, it's it's a necessary part of our attention to hunger that we also be working to influence those policies to recognize that every person should be getting food. That's that's the teaching of the Catholic Church. Amen. And as you have gotten more engaged with this, uh, Dr. Johnson, how has it impacted you personally? Mm. So I think um, this, this thinking about prayer it's been a great occasion for me to to think more about something that is uh, very important to me, very central to the the way I think about my work, and that is that these questions, big questions about social ethics like hunger, they're not distant from my prayer life. They're actually right there when I'm trying to say grace over my family's dinner, social ethics issues, these kind of big questions are already right at the center of this. If I'm going to offer a genuine and truthful prayer, because I think (laughs) praying is our our duty and our privilege and our joy, and we need to do it very carefully. If I'm going to offer that prayer well, then I have to really think about what I'm I'm saying and try to describe accurately what's going on. You know, God has given us a good earth, and we absolutely should be grateful for it. And we should be hungry, longing, <laughs> ardently longing for the day that all of us can enjoy that resource together, that all of us can be sharing in that banquet. That's that's the heavenly banquet that we're headed for eventually. And my prayer is that every day we more and more are beginning to share in that banquet that all of us will be together in in the end. Yeah, amen, amen. And uh, I think... You know, what which, which you're highlighting is just our prompting, if you will, to pray because that is necessary, but mm-hmm. then pray and ask God, how can I make a difference in whatever form or fashion that looks like to help those who have less than, than, than us. So, Dr. Johnson, it's been great having you on Faith Alive. Uh, thank you so much and God bless. Experience the incredible story of a woman who Time Magazine named the most influential Catholic woman in the United States. Rita Rizzo, the future Mother Angelica, grew up in a working-class neighborhood in Canton, Ohio during the Great Depression. Rita's father abandoned the family before she was five years old. Her early years of trial were compounded by a debilitating illness until she was healed by Jesus through a woman named Rhoda Wise. That healing set her life on a course that would ultimately change the world. Learn the amazing story of Rita Rizzo at the Mother Angelica Museum in her hometown of Canton, Ohio. Go to www.motherangelicamuseum.com. Be inspired. Plan your visit now at MotherAngelicaMuseum.com. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. 
Welcome back to Faith Alive, and what a great program we had today. First of all, talking about things we're doing at the diocese. Uh, we started off with uh, Deacon Phil DeNovo and Tom Lucas and the Catholic Community Supper that they provide every Wednesday, other than the first Wednesday at Holy Angels Catholic Church. And it's just great that they have hot meals. Uh, as Deacon Phil says, he prays with the folks that come in. And they're also looking at, you know, actually having a meal with folks. And we then heard from Chris Kramer from St. Pat Heather Downs Parish, who has a food pantry and helps people in need. And not only, you know, they come to get food, but they actually deliver food to folks. And, of course, then we had Dr. Kelly Johnson, who's the associate professor at the Father of Harid Chair of Social Justice University of Dayton. And she talked about how to say grace over meals. And not only do we give thanks, but then we also are given a call to help others and get them food and provide support. So I think, you know, as that ties into Catholic Charities, that's what we do all so well and so frequently on a daily basis at our Hope Food Pantry in Mansfield, um, at Helping Hands of St. Louis uh, here in East Toledo, and then also at our shelters at Miriam House of Norwalk and La Posada in, uh, in Toledo, where uh, when people come to us and need shelter, we get them food and make sure that the basic needs are met. And we help anyone who needs food, anyone who needs to to be taken care of, we do, because we are the Catholic Church. And that is a role and goal of what we do. But even more so than the food, it's just being the hands and face of Jesus Christ to anyone we encounter. And with that encounter, we're hoping that they see the love and the joy of Christ in our, in our midst and in their midst, and that perhaps... Uh, whatever is going on in their lives, they see that they're loved. And uh, through Christ and through our efforts, that they're loved and that they have a life worth living and that perhaps that there's hope. And through that hope, that they can change their lives and then, you know, maybe as we've heard so many times, they give back uh, in, in their own way. So thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate you listening to Faith Alive. Until next week, God bless. You've been listening to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster. For more information about Catholic Charities programs and services, visit catholiccharitiesnwo.org. You can listen to this and other episodes anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio mobile app and at annunciationradio.com.